Hey everyone, author and astronomer John Reed here from Learn to Stargaze, and in this video, I'm going to explain how to observe the 110 Messier objects, by far the world's most famous list of stargazing targets. And I'm also officially announcing my new book, 110 Things to See with a Telescope, which, as you guessed it, is all about these 110 objects and how to find each and every one of them with your backyard telescope. And if you observe all these objects and document your observations, there are several organizations like the Astronomical League in the USA and the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada that will award you a certificate for this accomplishment. Not only will this book help you find each target, but it also gives you a place to document your observations and apply for your Messier certificate. I've even included application forms and instructions in the appendix. So let's get started. This is Learn to Stargaze. Now this list of 110 astronomical objects was created by a French comet hunter named Charles Messier in the late 1700s. The list was originally published in a French astronomy journal called Connaissance des Temps. The list originally contained 103 objects, but in reviewing Charles Messier's notes, later astronomers added an additional seven objects, adding up to a total of 110. Some of these objects were discovered by Charles Messier or by his friend and collaborator, Pierre Méchamp, while some were discovered by other astronomers. Some of these objects, like the Pleiades, are bright enough to be seen without a telescope and have been known since antiquity. The objects are named after Messier's initial M and their corresponding number from his catalog. So what are these objects? In Charles Messier's time, for the most part, astronomers didn't know but they knew they weren't comets because they were fixed in place. They didn't change position from night to night. We now know these objects as galaxies, star clusters, and nebula, some of the most interesting objects in our sky. The Messier list also includes a double star, the small Sagittarius star cloud, and an asterism. So you might be thinking, can I simply go out in my backyard, stay up all night, and observe all of these objects? Well, it's theoretically possible, but only at a very specific time of the year, and we'll talk about that later. There are a few reasons why it's generally not possible or even advised to see all of the objects at once. In fact, it generally takes the better part of a year to observe and appreciate them all. But why? Reason number one is that the skies are seasonal. Let's say you only observe right after dusk, then only about a quarter of the objects are visible at that time. If you only observe in the evenings, you'll want to divide this list of objects into the four seasons which we've done in our book. We've even color coordinated for you. You've got your autumn targets, your winter targets, your spring targets, and your summer targets. Reason number two is your location on Earth. Only those living between 20 degrees south and 55 degrees north can see all of these objects from their location. So, for example, if you live in Alaska or New Zealand, you're only going to be able to observe a certain fraction of these objects. The rest of the objects are blocked by the Earth all night and all year from your location. Even if you live within these latitudes, some of the objects may still be quite challenging, only rising above your horizon for a brief period of time. If you live up north, for example, the southern objects may appear so close to the horizon that they're incredibly challenging to find. And if you live in the south, the northern objects will present a similar challenge. Reason number three you're probably not going to observe all the objects from your backyard is light pollution. Now you can probably see a little over half of these objects from a city over the course of the year. But to see all the objects on this list, you're going to have to get away from artificial light sources, as in like an hour away from the closest city or town. It doesn't matter how large your telescope is, if you live in a city, you will not be able to see the dimmer galaxies. Yes, I know they can be photographed from the city because cameras tend to be a lot more sensitive than your eyes, but if you're trying to earn your certificate, you must see these objects for yourself through the eyepiece. Now we need to take a moment to discuss gear. The type of telescope you're using as well as other equipment will affect your ability to find and appreciate these objects. Now there are folks who have seen most of the Messier objects with only binoculars but I found identifying Messier objects with binoculars to be extremely challenging. That said, the Astronomical League has a Messier object binocular program, and you only need to observe 50 objects to earn a certificate. This also means that yes, it's possible to see most of the objects with a small telescope, 
However, that doesn't mean it will be easy. For completing the entire list, we recommend a moderately sized telescope like a Dobsonian, ideally one with six to eight inches of aperture or higher. Although a smaller but high quality refractor, SCT, or Mac could probably do the job just as well, again, assuming dark, moonless skies. For improving the view of certain Messier objects, some folks like to invest in a narrowband filter like the UHC or ultra high contrast filter. For objects that are improved by the use of a narrowband filter, we've included a note in our book in the observing tip section of the page. Now, some of you have computerized go-to telescopes. And yes, these telescopes can make short work of the Messier list. But if you're trying to go for that certificate, these telescopes may not be allowed. So be sure to check the rules carefully for the certificate you are attempting to complete. The Royal Astronomical Society of Canada has a specific certificate program just for people using go-to telescopes. Speaking of gear, the easiest way to find objects in the night sky without a computerized telescope is with a bullseye finder. There are several types of these finders, the most popular being the Telrad, followed by the Rigel Quick Finder and Celestron Star Pointer Pro. These finders have a little window that displays a bullseye that you line up with the sky. When looking for an object, you simply check the star map and line up the bullseye with the sky exactly as shown. The second best option is the red dot finder. It's similar to the bullseye, except the little window only shows a dot. Compared to the bullseye, it's only slightly more challenging to gauge the approximate distance from your reference stars on the star map. From personal experience, finder telescopes or simply finder scopes, the kind that magnify the sky are much more challenging. I primarily use mine for aligning go-to telescopes to bright stars or for targeting planets. Older books on the Messier list used to include finder charts for finder telescopes, but I haven't found these older style charts to be particularly easy to follow. Now let's go over some tips for finding and observing the most challenging objects. Okay, so assuming you've got a decent telescope, you've traveled to dark and moonless skies, and the weather is clear and the seeing conditions are good, there are still a few things you'll need to do in order to guarantee you'll be able to observe all the objects for that particular season. Number one is make sure your telescope is in perfect working order. The finder scope should be precisely, and I mean precisely, aligned to the telescope. This is easier to do during the day by pointing the telescope at a distant landmark like the top of a flagpole. You also need to make sure that the telescope has had time to cool down. If you've taken the telescope out of a hot car or from inside a warm building, the image you get through the scope will be degraded for various reasons until the scope reaches the ambient outdoor temperature. This could take a few minutes for smaller telescopes, but larger Dobsonians could take as much as an hour or more to cool down. Tip number two is that you need to adapt your eyes to the dark. This process takes about 20 minutes. This means not looking at your cell phone screen, no porch lights or white flashlights, etc. For reading your guidebook, I recommend a dim red flashlight. If you need a bit more light, try turning your cell phone on but pointing it down at the page, not at your face. Keep in mind that looking directly at a bright light source resets the 20 minute adaptation process. In addition to the 20 minute dark adaptation, some stargazers I know go the entire day without looking at screens. The third tip is that you need to learn to use averted vision. This means not looking directly at your target through the eyepiece. The strategy is as follows. Point the telescope exactly where you believe the object to be so that the target is hypothetically centered in the eyepiece. Then look through your eyepiece, but off to the side. If the object is within your telescope's field of view, it should appear brighter when you're looking to the side. For some targets, you might find that you can only see the object using the strategy. Another strategy for seeing more detail on your objects is to lightly tap or shake the telescope. The idea here is to allow the light to fall randomly on more sensitive regions of your eye. We call this the tap tap trick. And finally, some tips and tricks on completing the list and earning your certificate. Generally, there are about two seasons worth of targets visible on a given night. You can often catch objects from the previous season right after sunset, and if you stay up late enough, the targets from the upcoming season will rise above the horizon. Also, targets located near the North Celestial Pole in what we call the circumpolar region are above the horizon every night and all year. We also recommend you sketch what you see. 
That's why on every page of this book, there are sketching circles. Your eye works very different from a camera. When you sketch, you're capturing the nuances that are unique to the human experience. You're also documenting your progress, something you'll look back on years from now as a reminder of how far you've come. You'll also want to record the sky conditions in addition to commenting on the weather. This means you'll need to record an estimate of the seeing and transparency. Note that observing programs often require this. I typically use the app Astrospheric to check the seeing and transparency before I begin observing, but there are detailed instructions for determining these metrics for yourself on page 14 of our book. Basically, you rate seeing from one to five based on this chart, and transparency can be described by the magnitude of the dimmest star you can see without a telescope. And there are some other things that you'll need to record from your observation session, like the telescope, eyepiece, barlow, and filter combination you're using, and the date, time, and location. As a bonus, record who you're observing with. This will help jog your fond memories of the event when reviewing your notes. Finally, take your time. Stargazing should never be frustrating. It's often considered one of the most relaxing hobbies. If your telescope is giving you trouble, it's possible you need to switch to a more simple design. It's often said that stargazing is a gateway to a life in the sciences. To be fascinated by space can change the entire direction of your life, as it has sure done for me. Now a quick note on Messier marathons. This is where you attempt to view as many Messier objects as you can on a single night. Note that most observing programs do not allow observations taken during marathons to count toward your certificate. This is because the spirit of that observing program is to take the time to appreciate what you're seeing. And you can't really do this in a race against the clock or well, a race against sunrise. Messier marathons occur on a moonless night, often on a weekend for practical purposes, every year around March 15th. This is when the sun is located in a part of the sky devoid of messy objects, so it's not blocking any of them. It generally works something like this. You start right after sunset, observing 10 autumn objects. Then you observe all the winter objects before they set below the horizon. Then you move on to the spring targets. After observing the spring objects and maybe a few summer objects, you go to bed for a while waking up a few hours before sunrise when you observe the remaining summer objects and then attempt to view the remaining autumn targets, including the most challenging marathon target, M30. Our book includes detailed instructions on completing a Messier marathon, as well as our recommendation for the best order to observe the targets. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video on the world's most famous stargazing list. If you're interested in observing these wonderful objects and getting credit for your observations, definitely check out 110 Things to See with a Telescope. It's available on Amazon in paperback and hardcover. And don't forget to leave a great review that really helps out us authors. Bonus if you include a picture of your telescope in the review. Please subscribe here to learn to stargaze so you don't miss the next video. Please comment below to let me know you're here. And remember, the future is looking up.